Let's continue. Um, Mikko had a session here just before me, and he about a dozen times said that um, now I don't have to show this because Sami showed it to you already, and it's kind of a not that sure if everyone perhaps got the. Got, uh, got what he said about it, because the thing is that we do exactly the same things. He does it for packaging, testing out the system account to make sure that the package actually installs as it's supposed to, as I do it. Like in the previous demonstration, I did it all for hacking into a system. So it's like, a, it's, we use the same things, but it's a totally different perspective of doing it, in doing it. Um, I'd say I'm not a, in any way an application packaging dude, but uh, I teach a lot of troubleshooting. And I always say that there are one of the most important tools that you can get is PSXSEC from sysinternals. And PSXSEC is used to get access to the system account the easiest way nowadays. And I always tell them that if you're working with SCCM, if you're working with MSI packages in any way, it must be your best friend. So there are two things about the system account. First of all, if you install a package, I, I see this all the time in any in environment. Someone has an MSI package, they open up command prompt, type MSI exec slash I, package name slash Q, N minus minus, bang, whatever. I'm not that good at it. Anyway, so, um, they test it out and they're happy. Woohoo! Works! Silent! Doesn't ask a question. Terrific! Yes! And then it fails. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's always good. What I will... Um, tell them to do is use PSXEC. You can take the exact same string you just typed in, like the MSI exec slash I blah blah blah, but just put PSXEC slash SID in front of it. Try it again. First of all, it's run with the system account. So as we saw, if, if you were here for Mikko's session, um, system works in a different way for using different user rights. It has more permission than an admin ever will. So it will have more privileges than an admin, but it's, it's restricted in many ways as it's not a normal user. Um, so it's different for the local computer, if you think about it. It's, it's not a normal user, so it will install with a special user. If you test it with an admin, which is a normal user, that's not the same case. But even more important is the fact that Windows has three different service accounts, local service, network service, and as I say, they're Mr. Local Service and Mr. Network Service, because those are service accounts that actually think they have some sort of power. And then there's Mrs. System. Mrs. System is the one that can actually decide anything, doesn't have to obey any policies, can do whatever she wants. Mrs. System and Network Service, when communicating out of your computer, will authenticate using the Active Directory's computer account. Local Service will authenticate outside of the box, they will authenticate with a null session with no passwords and no user IDs. So now, if you install, just to put some context here, if you would test this out like this, MSI exec i server to software adobe.msi. Bang. You don't know. You, you, you were supposed to know. Okay, let's pretend it's this. Okay, anyway, whatever. Uh, now, what, it, what, it, what will it do? It will use my user account to authenticate to the server. That's so far from the truth, because it's not the system account I'm using. It'll use a normal user, usually some freaking domain admin, that can access whatever anyway. 
and it will install with that account. But if you just change this a tiny way and you will get rid of most of your SCCM problems. So an MSI troubles, so you just put this in front of it and now you're doing it correctly. Because now you are authenticating out of the box with the computer account. So you will know if you have share, per share permissions, NTFS file permissions. Have you, for example, taken into account that you have to give out read rights to read permissions to domain computers instead of domain users? Because you're not, if you try it without the PSXSEC, you're a domain user anyway, but you're not a domain computer. So that's the, one of the main things for PSXSEC is to make sure that you test your packages, you test. The same goes for Active Directory, Active Directory scripts. If you're going to run Active Directory startup scripts or shutdown scripts, or if you're going to run Active Directory scheduled tasks, if you're going to run PowerShell scripts, that's the proper way of testing if your scripts will work. Just make sure you test them with the system account. Mikko also mentioned that I did these things that now he doesn't have to explain, but I still think you didn't explain, so I will. Um, uh, not in a bad way. What I mean is that there's one, the coolest place on earth, if you ask me about Windows, is something that's built into the operating system since NT's beginning, and it's built for Microsoft's own troubleshooting team. So Microsoft's own product support services needed a way to cheat the customer into believing that they are just opening up a piece of, piece of an application, but instead they can hide a debugger behind it. That's what image file execution options, one of its main intentions in the beginning was. Just to be able to hide a debugger. Instead of launching a software, you will actually launch a debugger and then launch a software and hide the debugger. But now image file execution options is the most powerful place if you're talking about why something gets executed in Windows. If I would ask you a question like, let's say we are in C temp. That's the temp folder, okay, on this machine. And I would run notepad.exe. Why does notepad work, although it's not in that folder? Path variable, fine, okay? Path variable is like Mr. Local Service. He believes he has some power here. And then we get to image file execution options, which is like the Mrs. System. So you can do whatever you want. And the best, of course, is to play around with your friends. So let's do a key for notepad.exe. And let's say notepad.exe uses a debugger, which in this case will be calculator.exe, like this. And now wherever you go and you start a notepad, you will always get the calculator. Wouldn't it be nice that if a friend of yours wanted to actually open up notepad, they would have to oh, every single time go to C, Windows, System32, and then right click notepad and open. And no, it won't work either. So this is just no way of getting rid of image file execution options. That's the most powerful one. So that's what my PowerPoint did. My PowerPoint injected a debugger for display switch.exe in the keynote. So display switch.exe usually changes your projection from your screen to the projector or what you want. So what I did was I injected a registry key with the PowerPoint. So you can see it here now, because I didn't take it off. So I can show it to you. So display switch.exe has a debugger of cmd.exe. That's why Windows P opens up a command prompt. And it just happens to be a, an executable that is available on the logon screen when no one has logged on. So I could just, for the fun of it, as easy make myself a easy to run a calculator. So Windows P would just open a calculator. Convenient? Cool. Okay. So let's take that hack away because I tend to forget it on my own computer and then it's really embarrassing because my own computer has been cracked for a few months when I start showing it in a class. Like when you, when you press Windows P, you will... Oh no. Just seem to forget it there. Um, 
So this one can easily be used for troubleshooting as well. Okay, fair enough. Let's try another one. So um, I forgot totally that I was going to show you one more. So what I use this a lot for is that I do troubleshooting and I work a lot with customers that have slow logons. That's one very common thing to diagnose, slow logons. So if you want to be able to diagnose a slow logon, you will have to be able to log on to a Windows box without logging on. And now that, that's another way of looking at the same thing. Mikko is talking about the same thing, but in a different context. I use this a lot for debugging, so, but I'm debugging the OS usually. So what I'll do is I'll do a key. Let's try something else. Utilman.exe, that works in Windows 10 as well. Somehow they took out the shift key thingy. And let's put another string value of debugger. And the debugger will be cmd.exe. And now, before anyone logs on to the computer, you will have the ability to start monitoring what will happen during the logon. Because you can press this cool button here behind me in the lower left corner, which will give you system rights. And now you can just, for example, use Process Explorer or Process Monitor or whatever, but you can do it without getting anyone logged on. So you can start doing debugging. It'll take a while, but it'll be there. So if you want to diagnose slow, slow logons, you need to be able to log on without logging on. That's the way of doing it. So the same thing, that's why hacking, cracking, and troubleshooting, and apparently MSI packaging go very well hand to hand. Same techniques, different context, okay? Well, what you don't want to do is, I will not mess my computer, but Mikko said, Mikko, uh, during the last session, he was using the session zero, which is the system accounts desktop. And he said that, Sami, Sami says that it's a female. That system is a female. But why does it have this ugly gray background and not a pink one? And uh, I said, yeah, it's female, but it's only due to permissions, not that much of a, not that much of a, her having different cool interior designs or anything like that. Uh, Mrs. System can get those as well. She has a profile. Her profile is totally empty by default, and she has an empty desktop, as Mikko said. But the worst thing for security and the most horrible piece of command line that you could ever run on a Windows box is possible, and it would be this. Do not go there. This will log you on without locking you on, kind of, because you will still have this hanging press control alt delete behind you, but you still have your desktop and stuff like that. But then it will create the profile for the system as well. So Mrs. System will have a cool and nice desktop and stuff like that, but it's very dangerous. Okay, there's one thing worse that you can do is hit IE with this. So do not go browsing on the internet with Mrs. System. You can do that as well, but that, that will end up in a disaster. Remember, she can do whatever. Someone was just asking, it was actually some of the organizers that were talking to me about like, you're talking about Mrs. System all the time, and like, how, how did you start calling her Mrs. System? And I told him that, that's, that I got married about two years ago, and that's when I totally started talking about Mrs. System. The good thing is that, uh, do you get these emails that you have to, do you, you are asked to pay for donations to Wikipedia? To send out emails like yearly? I, I haven't paid that for the past two years because my wife seems to know everything, so I don't really need Wikipedia for anything, so I'm not, I'm not paying anymore. <laughs> All right. Um, that was mainly to set the stage. So just because so many people were, co were comparing what I do with what Mikko does. So same techniques because system is the same user account that's used by MSI packages when installed, usually. And it's the same user account that's used for compromising the computer. 
Now, what we had in Keynote, I'm trying to pump up that a little bit with techniques on how to actually implement this stuff and um, to show you a few things about those. We'll start with BitLocker. So, I would say, uh, if you're talking about application management, I would say that you will have to respect the fact that we have probably seen the last Windows that doesn't have some kind of an encryption already built in. If you buy a Windows 8.1 machine that supports instant Go standards like Atom processors or ARM processors, they actually have a what they call pervasive encryption. So they already have BitLocker enabled when, they, when you buy them. There's actually no way of buying a computer without encryption. You will have to accept that it will be there. And it will, in some places, it might make your life a bit more hard. When, when have I heard about this being hard for someone who's installing software? Is from people who are, who are installing agents that are actually very low level on the operating system. Because, for example, when you install BitLocker, you're using a TPM chip. Hopefully, the TPM chip will take a hash value of your boot environment. And if you change the boot environment, your computer will be locked. You will need a recovery key to start it. So, for example, installing a really low-level driver or updating a BIOS or upgrading UEFI, whatever sort of operation like that, and you will end up with a locked machine. There's no way of the user putting it up. Encryption is mandatory. That's the funniest thing. I've asked Microsoft dozens of times, why will they not fix the holes that I keep on showing at these events and laughing about it? It's, um, as you know, every other operating system breaks if you get physical access and it doesn't have an encryption. So it's not like uh, any magic there. It's easy. But why won't they fix it? Because there's possibility to fix it. It would be easy to change the executables that are running on the logon screen to use local service and not system. They did it for Windows XP. If you remember, Windows 2000 could be hacked into with the most ridiculous way. Because in Windows 2000, you just changed your default user's screen saver to cmd.exe. And then you went to the logon screen and waited. And when the screen saver popped up, it was system with a command prompt. So you hacked in. If you did it in Windows XP, if you did that in Windows XP, it opened up a command prompt, but you couldn't do anything with it because they changed it to use local service. If you think about it, display, changing a display from your monitor to an external device, turning on sound for Utilman, for example, or sticky keys, banging shift keys five times to make it stick. These are not stuff that need system rights. This is stuff that can be easily done with local service. So they would have an easy fix. I have even told them that this is the way to fix it. But the silly thing about after Vista was that when I started talking to them again, and I asked them, why won't you fix, for example, this? At that time, Utilman was a new one because it came out in Vista. Why won't you fix the Utilman crack? And they wouldn't even go into the conversation. They just looked at me and said, BitLocker. OK, I get it, but like it's a whole size of a bull. Like, can you just fix it? BitLocker. Can we discuss this? BitLocker. Can you know, do you know any other words than BitLocker? BitLocker. So they don't even want to talk about it, because their point of view is that there is no way of building a secure computer without hard disk encryption. So you will anyway have to have BitLocker, but that's like that's a great demonstration because it just shows how ridiculously easy it is. Like one copy command breaks any Windows from XP to Server 2012 R2 domain controller. It's like that's silly. Luckily. BitLocker can be used without two-factor authentication in 95% of cases. That's the one, co one concept that's often missed is that even when changing from Windows 7 to Windows 8.1, Microsoft changes the official recommendation. Windows 7, Microsoft's official recommendation was that BitLocker computers should be protected with a PIN code. 
You use a pin code to open up your machine. With Windows 8.1, even the official recommendation is to use no two-factor authentication, only TPM. And 95% of my customers are fine with plain TPM. So they don't have a password, they don't have a USB key. They have BitLocker, it blocks 99.99% .99 of all penetration tests that we've done and real life tests that we've done. There will always be some NSA dude who will get in. This gets into ridiculous conversations. I don't even know if I should tell you this, but you know, Finland is a really scary place. Um, if you talk to nurses in hospitals, nurses in hospitals seem to all be migrating to Norway. I thought it was because of the better salary, because it's like five times better than Finland. And I thought it was because of the salary, but it seems to be because of security. Because I was trying to do an implementation of BitLocker to a local hospital in Finland. And I ended up being in a conversation where the chief security officer told me that we will need to have USB sticks for the BitLocker protection. It's like, why don't you use pin codes if you need a two-factor authentication? Wouldn't it be easier? No, but Sammy, don't you know that pin codes are a mental proof of ownership and USB keys are a physical proof of ownership? I said, yes, I know. So why? Well, it's because if our nurses travel to a conference in Germany and if they get tortured, they might tell the pin code. <laughs> if you have a USB key, you can always Ditch it, throw it away, or swallow it. <laughs> and that's when I was, I didn't know what to say. This is a customer relations thing I do anyway, so I tried to listen and not laugh, but I like, you've got to be kidding me. Am I honestly in a conversation talking about Finnish nurses and the possibility of them getting tortured when they go to conferences? No wonder they're going to Norway. Um, you can block, as I said, 99.99% .99 of cases. If you want to build a secure computer with BitLocker, there's a few things you have to take into account. I'd say that you're better off with Windows 8.1 than Windows 7. So Windows 8.1 is way more secure than 7. It's not because of it being unusable and no one would like to hack it, but it's because of it has having a few really big changes. For example, in Windows 7, all DMA ports, which are the most scary ones, Firewire, Thunderbolt, stuff like that, in Windows 7 and Windows 8, they are opened by default, but with Windows 8.1, if you lock the machine, it will actually prevent the installation of new devices in these, in these buses. Only when you lock on, it will, will it allow another Thunderbolt device, for example. So there are actual changes in the operating system, even between 8 and 8.1. But that's not the thing to talk about, really, because 8.1 is end of support next year. Oh, sorry, 8.0 is end of support next year, so you will be getting rid of it anyway. Windows 7 is a thing, because it has over 51% of market share currently. So Windows 7, I would suggest you use um, in if your, com if your company isn't a really, really high secure one, or if your security policy doesn't require it, then I would still say that you start with TPM protection only. How does it work? Just cutting some corners here, but basically you have a TPM chip, which will house an encryption key, and the encryption key is used to open up another encryption key on the hard disk itself. But the thing is that the TPM chip is protected. So the TPM chip, chip is protected with the hash value of your boot environment. If anyone changes your boot environment in any way, changes the boot order, bad thing is that plugs it into a docking station, which changes the boot order. <laughs> this is bad. <laughs> but uh, changes the boot order, upgrades BIOS, replaces UEFI with a malware one, tries to open it up with Windows PE like I did tries to open it up with Linux, tries to open it up with Mac, tapes, takes the disk to another computer, all stuff is prevented because the TPM will instantly be locked and you have no way of opening the computer. 
And now we have the badass security folks in the audience that are like, yeah, but there's so many ways of getting bastard. Sure, I did this in TechEd. I opened up the conversation for 650 people and told them that let's do a competition. Crack my computer. I only had a Surface RT, which is encrypted by default, but I had Surface RT with BitLocker. TPM protection, no pin code, no USB keys. Go ahead, crack it. What would you have to do to crack it? First of all, I will have to use strong passwords, because if you open up my computer, it won't ask for an extra password or pin code or USB key. It will go to the logout screen. I will have to protect it. I can't allow Firewire or Thunderbolt, because it could be used to bypass it. So then comes into the picture something called the Princeton attack. Princeton attack was something that BitLocker was um, said to have been broken with multiple occasions. And it is doable, definitely. Um, Princeton attack works in a way that you take your computer, you use ice or ice spray to cool down your memory, and then you take the smallest possible Linux kernel. And when you've frozen the memory, you will reboot the machine with the Linux kernel. It's small as possible so that it will not overwrite the memory more than is necessary. So that there is the big possibility of the BitLocker key still being inside of the memory because it's frozen and it stays there for a few minutes. But possibly, usually a few seconds, but Probably it can be done for even a few minutes and that way you will boot the machine and get the code Well, the thing is that Windows 8.1 or Windows 8 UEFI Secure boot enabled 100% impossible Secure boot will not let you boot with the Linux kernel So if you haven't figured out what secure boot is good for it's Amazing for protecting computers that have BitLocker so if you have a Windows 8.1 machine with UEFI, Secure Boot on, Princeton Attack, no more. There's no way of doing it. So we have to get to the next phase, which is freeze the memory, take it off the machine. Take it to your Linux laboratory, which every threat that we face usually have their own Linux laboratory. They put the chips in a Linux reader and read the BitLocker keys from the chips, doing this in a few minutes, okay? They have a few minutes to do it. So they do that. Well, I was sure that there would be someone in the audience in TechEd that would be almost willing to try and do it. But it's really funny to see them ripping off the box of Surface RT because it's a system on a chip and it doesn't have any memory chips to take off. So they have to start ripping the memory chips off the motherboard. And do that in a few minutes before you run to your Linux laboratory and, you know. And the thing is that you will anyway, anyway, you will fail with social engineering, not with this. The guy will read the malicious PowerPoint and you will get stuff sent out of your environment instead of someone actually having a Linux laboratory on cracking open. You shouldn't be worried about that. That's why TPM works for 95% of cases. But you might have, like Finnish military has a regulation that says that you have to use two-factor authentication. So there's no, no way of me sa telling them that you, would, you could do it without. Because they have a regulation that sa states that you need it. So that's when you use pin codes. Then you have to do, use some more. Or the nurses use the USB keys. So there's a... A lot of stuff that you have to take into account if you're talking about secure computers. And that's the reason why we're going to go through a few of these. So, AppLocker, let's take a few demos next. I'll talk to you about BitLocker. I've done a 75-minute presentation on BitLocker in TechEd, and I will in Barcelona in a few weeks. So, I will tell you as much as you want, but uh, there's no possibility of fitting it here. Uh, it was super fun, you know, the guys, I, ha I made a... I made a really cool demo because um, there was a guy who was, I had to somehow show them like, you know that it's better to just threaten your life to get the pin code rather than trying to hack a 
freaking Linux laboratory thingy. So what I did was, before I went to Houston, I went to Atlanta, and I went to the local hardware store and bought a personal item, as I told the uh, security officers at the airport, but I uh, bought a personal item and I went to the, went to Houston and then I had a demo on my Surface RT. We'll do it this way. You get my Surface RT with no pin codes, no USB keys. You start and try to hack into it and we make it a competition. We had a guy that had a laptop which has a pin code protection, okay? And we'll do a competition. You start hacking my RT and I try to get his pin code quicker. Then I said, let's go, and then I took a 15-inch wrench and started running at the guy like this. Okay, 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 I'll tell. So it's always easier and a lot cheaper to buy the 15-inch wrench and just, just beat the crap out of the guy. You'll get the pin code. That's why, that's, why, that's, that's why if you go to a security conference, if there's some guy who's yelling, I asked people there, can you crack... Can you do this Linux frozen memory thingy? Yes. Two guys. Yes. Yes. So that's like instantly you know that those are not the ones to be worried about. Come on, if you're talking about real criminals, they're sitting in the back row. You there at the cheap seats, you know. <laughs> they're not talking. They're not going to say, hey, I'm able to hack Linux and Windows and whatever. So this is like, that's so stupid. That's why it's easy to say that out loud to say, like, would you be willing to hack my computer? Because they will not come in front of the class. It's different if you go to Black Hat or some hacking conference. That's different, because they're there for that. But still, like a normal conference, it's, I'm not scared of saying, it. can you hack my computer? If he's a real professional, he will not get in front of an audience with a recorded session. It's silly, OK? So app locker is I think mandatory, but it's only for enterprise versions, so it can't be used everywhere. Uh, how I implement AppLocker is a quite, of a quite a quick thingy, so we'll do a demo on this. First of all, there are holes in AppLocker. So let's see. There's our user. What you need is First of all, services. So by default, the service that takes care of identifying applications in the core OS is not turned on. So application identity. I've turned it on for the keynote presentation. So this is by default on manual, and you will have to turn it to automatic. That needs to be there. After you've done that, then you can go for group policy. So we can do just local group policy in this case. But of course, usually would do it on a domain controller. I, well, not on a domain controller, but on the domain. So here we go. And the default settings for application control policies are quite good. So when you go here, you will first have to do some decisions. So you will turn on app locker and uh, configure rule enforcement or properties. Let's take some zoom it so you can perhaps see it a little bit better. I should have zoom it here. So here we go. It will look after four different things that can be executed. So executable, meaning the old basic executable desktop software, Windows installer, MSI packages, scripts, all that the scripting host is taking care of. So it can be VPS, for example, or CMDs or something like that. And then there's packaged app rules, which has nothing to do with app packaging here in this event, as it's uh, modern apps of Windows. It's not packaged app as a general, it's only the modern ones. The running in the super cool start screen. You know that in Windows 10, then they can now run software in Windows? That's so cool. I think I was laughing my <coughs> behind off when I looked at, the, looked at the video from the announcement of Windows 10. We can now run applications in Windows. <laughs> Didn't you guys do that at like 83? 
I think the, I think the whole product is called Windows. Like. Okay, so we can audit or enforce. This is the uh, what we call the bus rule, um, which means that you will only get notified in the event log if something would be prevented if you had enforced it. So you get customers that are like, perhaps we will do some monitoring for the first two months to see that nothing bad happens and people don't get pissed. And then was I had a customer with the biggest city in Finland, and he said that like, come on guys, it's like, uh, are you really a wuss? Which means like, uh, yeah, you know what it means, hopefully. So, because I won't say the other way. <laughs> uh, rather just, I'd rather just um, put it on enforced, which means that your help desk will be called when something doesn't work. I, of course, hope you won't have to, um, that you can do some monitoring perhaps first, but you will have to go to enforce quite quickly. There's, the auditing is just like, it, it's so slow a process that usually it's better to go enforced. So let's enforce this. Then there's the advanced tab. You have now seen it once in your life, and you, no, you need not to see it ever again, okay? Usually that's a trick used by trainers who don't know what they're talking about, so they just play around and don't tell you, but it's not that. It's, uh, it will start to monitor instead of the actual processes, it will start to monitor DLL calls inside of processes, so function calls. That means that it will slow down the machine so much that you will not want to put that on by default. It's used by some environments which are really, really high secure. All right, enforce rules, let's put that on. And then we have something called, oops, sorry. Go to executable rules, right click, and there you can choose to add default rules. And default rules are a really good base. That's kind of a, it's a good start for anyone. You will have to add some, but as I said, I have a 35,000 workstation environment with 14 rules, so not that much. So what it says, it says that admins can run whatever anyway, sure. Everyone can run anything that's in the Windows folder and anyone can run anything that is in the program files folder. We were talking outside of the room here about the, how, app, how App, how managed and um, packaged applications tend to break security in many places. And one of them is that they add, the packages add permissions to, for example, program files. Which, if you are doing packaging, I would, I will take this opportunity to ask you, please don't do it. Because you are breaking the foundations of Windows security. AppLocker works great if someone doesn't break the foundations, for example, program files and Windows being a place where normal users will not write anything. It's not meant for that. It's said in the Windows documentation for the developers. It's said there that do not do this. But I know it's not easy, and I know people do it a lot. So one thing you have to do, even if you put this in, let's, let's pretend, think about it. If you now have a computer that you've done the image for, so some of your company has done the image and installed it with SCCM or whatever, and you don't have admin rights, and you can't run anything else but stuff that's in Windows or program files, how would you put a malware on my computer? Are you all finished? <laughs> they don't ask any questions or raise their hands. So, um, good. It's nice to know that you are silent because that's what you should be. It's not that easy. Um, for a malware, this environment is horrible. The only, place, only places that can run stuff is the, is the places that would require admin rights. So, are there holes in it? Definitely. You have to do some auditing on your own environment. So sad to say, but Microsoft hasn't done a very good job on this one. So what we'll do is we'll use the sysinternals tool and we'll check how well the Windows folder is actually protected. We'll use sysinternals access check, which will go through the folder and check everything below it 
to see if it has some right permissions for users. So let's take Windows, for example. So let's access check and see all writable, writable locations for normal users in C Windows. Those are the main ones we hit, and we will have more. So these are stuff you will have to uh, put as an, ex as an exception on your rule. It's not that easy. So luckily those are subfolders of service profiles, etc. So you can, luckily you don't have to take every single line. But there are places that normal users can write to. And you have to have these as exceptions. Otherwise, your students, for example, in schools, they will read Google and they will run their programs. Because it's just a piece of a copy instruction. Just copy a file there and it will run in any of those. So there's a lot. And the first three are good examples. So for example, in this case, if there would be a app locker here enabled, so this guy shouldn't be able to run team viewer. It's blocked by policy. What he could do is just take this, copy it, go to C, sorry, C Windows. Tasks, for example, here, paste it here, and run it from there. It will take a while, but as you see, it's not producing any errors anymore. If you do Firefox, the bad thing is that it will actually first download the installer, which will still be in the wrong place, so you have to put that there as well. But students are good at finding their ways, so you know the principal fault in this. Um, we've got about 20 seconds. That's nice. Only a few topics to cover. We'll finish with AppLocker. We'll get the slides later on. There's uh, also some slides about um, instructions on how to get rid of admin rights. I can't tell you everything here because I haven't paid for my sponsorship session and I agree, I, I admit there will be some links to a certain company that produces software that might help you. Let's put it that way. Uh, the main thing about AppLocker, why it fails, why people fail whitelisting is because of targeting items instead of containers. Instead of trying to make a whitelist rule that says that allow teamviewer.exe. You will do a rule that says allow everything in program files and take away their admin rights. You hit about 4,000 of those rows that I said in the keynote of the customer having 8,000 rows. You hit about 4,000 items with a single container. So you play it differently. Take away admin rights, then insert app locker, use containers, do not use items. You will never succeed with using items. You will use it for two years and then we, you will have a riot of help desk support people hitting you with the 15 inch wrench. So it's unmanageable. Audit your installations for security holes. Now Mikko knows what I'm looking for because I'm trying to figure out which is the shortcut to Skip a few slides. <laughs> I won't lie to you, there are a few. So there's things about IPsec and the least privilege, as I said. But I've only given, given 40 minutes and I'm sorry, but we'll take this offline from here. Thanks everyone for joining. Please do fill in the evals. Thank you. You're welcome to come forward as well.